my channel. So this is the third video in my RBF interpolation sequence where in the first video we started and we just did a one-dimensional interpolation and we did it with the exponential dot product kernel and the Gaussian RBF kernel. The next video what we did is we turned this to two dimensions and honestly it's arbitrarily high dimensions except it, you know for pretty pictures all we can really do are like two dimensions so I showed you how to do that. And now I'm going to show you how to do it faster. So in the first two videos, all it really took was a bunch of for loops, a little bit of an inverse applied to a gram matrix, and then we you know, perform the multiplication. So if you take a look at, say, this image here. So here we have a gram matrix, that is the matrix on the bottom left there, hitting this, this vector of weights in orange. And we have the output F in blue there. And if we just invert it and find those weights, those weights can go on to this function s of x, which then performs the interpolation. And so s of x is made to match those points at the very top, where you have x at 1, f of x1, x2, f of x2, etc. And so at x1, x2, x3, etc., you have s of x1 is equal to f of x1, and s of x2 is equal to f of x2, and etc. And so it's really easy to code, and I showed you how to do that. It wasn't too bad. And we used Frankie's function, which is this nice hilly function, as a benchmark. Now, I'd like to show you how to do this faster. Using loops is probably the slowest thing you can do in MATLAB. There's some sort of weird overhead that comes in there, and if you get rid of the loops and you vectorize your code, it makes it run much, much faster. So I'm going to show you how to do it with the exponential dot product kernel now. And uh, in the next video, I'll show you how to do it with the Gaussian RBF. I only have a few minutes, so I figured I'd just go ahead and crank this out. I also didn't do as much touch-ups to my figures here. But here's the idea. So we take a matrix where each one of our input sites is a column in our matrix. And so it's just x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xm, where m is the total number of samples we have and here it, what we want to do is we want to do the exponential dot product kernel right and so what we're going to do is we're going to take x transpose and multiply by x and what that does is it gives us a matrix of size m by m where we have an a pairwise inner products or pairwise dot products between each of the input sites and so that works out fairly well there and then what I want to do is I want to turn this to an exponential dot product kernel, and so I'm going to take the exponential of this. Now, here I actually left mu is equal to 1, but if you just take exponentiate and divide by mu, that's the more general case. I guess I wrote this a little too fast. But you see here, uh, we have the exponential function raised to the xi transpose times xj, and that is exactly the exponential dot product kernel yeah, modulo the mu. And so that really is the same as this matrix here in the interpolation scheme. And so that, that'll, that'll give us the gram matrix that we want to invert in order to perform the interpolation. And this works much faster than doing the for loops, and we'll use a tick and talk if you haven't seen them before, and they'll tell us exactly how fast all this goes. There's other ways to measure speed in MATLAB, but just to keep it simple, we'll use tick and talk. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and well, jump into MATLAB. All right, so I left my intro out. Hold on, here's my intro. Okay, there we go. So, uh, all right, so a little bit of gas. I'm still learning how to use OBS and set things up the way I wanted to. All right, so here we have exactly where we left off last time. So this is our two-dimensional interpolation scheme, and this used the Frankie's function and so this was the thing we were trying to plot and you know just to remind you or if you haven't been here before uh, let's go ahead and make a plot of this so if I go ahead and evaluate this here this way we go this is Frankie's function Frankie's function is four different Gaussians all added and subtracted against each other and we have local mi maxima well we have global maximum there we have local maximum here we have a local a global minimum there and we have saddle points and whatnot and this is turned into a standard benchmark for doing sort of two-dimensional interpolation so and the interpolation sites uh, these we designate these as 
you know, through how many samples. And I use this deprecated function halt in sequence that used to be available on Math Lab, MATLAB Central. There is a halt in sequence routine inside of MATLAB, but I forgot to install that toolbox. So, uh, so now I have to use this deprecated one, but that's all I used anyway. And so, anyways, so if I go ahead and plot this, uh, you'll see our sites. So I use plot three, which basically puts you know, uh, all of our information to a 3D plot, and here you go. So these are our interpolation sites. And so, you know, X and Y coordinates here, and, uh, you know, the RZ coordinate uh, there. So not too bad. And we saw last time that we actually get pretty decent interpolation. So if I press run on this, I'm not sure what, what we're using for interpolation right now, but uh, yeah, so that's pretty good. So this is our interpolation. It seems kind of wobbly, but if you take a look at the actual error, uh, and I need to make figure three pop up automatically, but let's go ahead and try it here. So our error is actually really, really small. And so it is three one hundredths, you know, and that's not too bad. It can be improved, uh, but you know, just for 100 points, that's not terrible. And I, looking at that graph, I'm guessing that we were already using the exponential dot product kernel. Yeah, so we have the Gaussian RBF here, but I immediately rewrite it as the exponential dot product kernel. And so we're only going to be caring about the exponential dot product kernel here. And I'm going to show you how we can make this grand matrix a lot faster. So, so what I'm going to do, so what we did last time is we took this kernel function and we took our samples and out of our halt and sequence that was all in H up here. And I, for each one of these, I and J, we put them into the gram matrix. So we evaluate our kernel at each one of our input sites, and or each pair of our input sites, and we made a matrix out of them. That is gram matrix. So, yeah, so that, that was the fill up there. And the principal thing that we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to get rid of this. And so I'm gonna put tick and talk here, and I'm just gonna run the code again see just see how fast that goes so tick and talk says it's two one hundredths that's not going to be a very good benchmark for us to go i mean anything could affect the two one hundredths of a second so why don't we crank up the number of samples let's say we're doing 400 and hopefully this doesn't take forever okay so to do that it took 0.344 seconds and Actually, if you take a look at our interpolation, it, it, it looks pretty good. Again, it's an exponential dot product kernel, and so it, it has some weird flare outs here and here. Um, but otherwise, at all the points we care about, uh, say here, here, and here, it seems to be doing pretty good. Okay. So now that was 0.3. Uh, let's take it up even higher. Now, we might actually start destroying our interpolation. If you add too many points, then it ends up. Uh, giving you condition number issues and we'd have to adjust, adjust mu. But let's just take it up to 800 and see if we can break the world. All right, so it's still busy, but that took a 1.25 seconds. And so that is one and a quarter seconds. And we see that uh, we are back to having some, some poor approximations in some spots, but you know, honestly, still not too bad. Uh, let's see. So yeah, it looks more or less like what we want. Uh, here, let me show you the uh, the error. It actually looks kind of cool. So I always feel like you're looking at the error of these guys in a surface plot just makes it look like some weird like mold coming down from the ceiling or something. If I can, I can't make it upside down, but uh, let's see. Oops, sorry. There. We go. Uh, yeah. So there we go. Uh, so it. It, that, that's the error. Um, yeah, it looks kind of funky or whatever, something growing out of, the, out of the floor. But it's actually not terrible, but it's not the best. And so, but that's not what we're here about. We are here about timing. So I got this to take one, one and a quarter seconds. And now let's see if we can reduce that. So all these matrix tricks I'm about to show you are, you know, typically what you do. So essentially what we have is we have our halt in the sequence. So if I look at H, each one of these columns here is a is a, a, 
a vector, so I somehow selected a whole row. But if you take a look, you know, here and here, if you can see that, so this guy and this guy, that is one of our sample sites. So what we're going to do is we're going to take h and times h transpose, that's the x I wrote earlier, and we're going to make it a matrix out of that. Now let me save this guy so we can compare later if we want to. And so we're going to say the gram matrix should be equal to, oh, and I apologize about the microphone, it's not insulated. No, I'll try to type, type late. Uh, it is going to be equal to the exponential function of h prime times h. And yeah, there we go. Now we also need to divide by mu. So I'll put over mu. And that is our gram matrix. So let's take a look. Tick. And I'll put talk. And let's see what happens. So if I evaluate the selection, it takes 0.01 seconds to make that. That is 100 times faster. You know, doing this even more than 100 times. And so if I, you know, say uncomment this and run this, let's see what the hell this takes. 1.29. So 1.29 or 0.01. Now, maybe you're not convinced. So uh, let me run these two together. So I have gram matrix one now in gram matrix. Evaluate these, All right? And so we have them side by side. And that is a dramatic percentage going down from 1.31 to 0 0.009 or 0 0.01. And so if I take a look at, at say the pairwise difference of all these things, so let's take a look at the, the largest error that we have. So we take the maximum of the maximum of the absolute value of the gram matrix minus the gram matrix one. Let's see what we get. The difference is on the order of 10 to the minus 16. That really comes down to just rounding errors. And so awesome. So we have just improved our code considerably. Now for that particular application, you know, maybe you don't care about the extra one second, but when it gets to be a larger and larger thing, this general notion of you vectorizing your code is going to speed it up by a hundred times. And I've seen something go from this code I've made going from say taking an hour to code up to just maybe 10 seconds. And so that is a tremendous amount of time that you're saving by doing this sort of thing. Okay, so let's see, what else can we vectorize while we're at it? Uh, so we have this code here. Can we vectorize this? I think that's feasible. Let's go ahead and take a look. So here, why don't we go ahead and see, tick and talk, how long this loop takes. I mean, we could probably do a lot to improve this, but I don't want to make this too long a video. I don't want to make it too complicated. So, but let's take a look. So in order to evaluate everything, this is where the bulk of the time goes into. Uh, well, it's still going, t 10 seconds. Let's see if we can improve this guy here. So instead of doing the sum, we're going to try to do something else. And so we're gonna take our weights and we're gonna multiply it by our kernel functions evaluated at, let's see. So what we want is we have a row vector of our weights now when I took the prime and we are going to exponentiate something so we need one over mu and now we just want the pairwise inner products of all these guys and we want this to turn into a column vector so we have our halton sequence these are our centers and this is going to be if i take our prime that's going to give us each one's going to be our rows and then we can take x i j semicolon y i j and yeah that should be enough so this here is a column vector and and this has h transpose and so that is a matrix where each one of our input values are now a row vector so when i multiply them Together, we should have as many rows or as in H prime, so it should be as tall as the number of samples we have, and it should be only one column wide. And 
So then that matches up with how many weights we have because the weights match the number of samples we have. And so this should do everything all at once. And then when you take the dot product between two vectors, it automatically sums them. So we don't have to do all this summing here. And so let's go ahead and we'll just say this is equal to this. So we, we're gonna have our Z approximation, IJ is equal to this guy. And now let's see what we get. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and well, let's just see comparison here, how fast this goes. So take this, evaluate it. Oops, I forgot to put a semicolon somewhere. There we go. Oh, and we don't even want this showing up anymore anyway. I already moved this way. So get rid of that. So now we removed one whole loop and let's see how things go. Point 0.1. So again, this is a hundredfold improvement over what we had before. And so now if I run the code, it should run super snappy and boom, boom. There we go. And so you're seeing here figure one is the number of sites we have. So that's 800, I think, last I checked. And we just did this interpolation super fast. And if I take a look at, say, figure two, we have our approximation. It looks exactly the same. There is no real difference in what we just saw, except that it ran way faster. And so this is the principle of vectorizing your code, and it shows you really how you can improve, you know, doing something like, you know, interpolation and other things like that, just by writing this in a smart way. So doing it for the Gaussian RBF is a little trickier. Uh, you have to use what is called rep map, and you have to, you know, take a diagonal of a matrix and other things like that. And I'll show you how to do that next time. Uh, but the Gaussian RBF is the really, really quick way to do this. So, in any case, so more is coming, and we're going to keep developing this RBF stuff for a while. And well, this wasn't RBF; it's an exponential dot product kernel. But you know, this sort of a kernel interpolation. Uh, after we do the Gaussian, we're going to do some symbolic toolbox stuff, and we're going to talk about the Wendland RBFs, and then we're going to do some look at conditioning. So as you get these sample points to be really, really tight, like what we see here in figure one, once you get it to be that tight, you're getting really bad condition numbers. And you know maybe we could survive this one, but if you have more samples, you want to be able to effectively use them. And so if your matrix starts to be poorly conditioned, that means you can't really invert it very well. And there's a lot of uncertainties there. And so Fast Hauer and McCourt back in 2012, they published a really clever paper where they come up with a really neat way of decomposing the Gaussian RBF. And it's fun to, to tear apart and, and see how that works. And so we'll go ahead and do that. It only really works for like two, three, maybe up to four dimensions, but you know, it, it's instructive one way or the other. Anyway, so if you like this, um, you know, please like, subscribe, comment, and I am always happy to hear from you guys. If I see a comment in my videos, that is really motivating to help me keep pushing on because, you know, sometimes, you know, you just feel like you're submitting everything to avoid. So, in any case, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>